Okay, continuing on, this would be lecture three of the chapter 12, Nervous System, part three. Um, finishing up with section 12.4, Special Senses. We finish with the ear looking at a sense of equilibrium, and then we're going to uh, distinguish between uh, static and dynamic equilibrium. And then in addition to that, we're going to start looking at the eye. So we're going to describe the roles of the accessory organs to the eye, uh, name the parts of the eye, and explain the functions of those parts, and explain how the eye refracts light, explain how the brain perceives the depth and dis distance, and then describe the visual nerve pathway, and then end it with 12.5. Uh, uh, that would be lifespan changes. So we finish 12.4 and end with 12.5, and that will be the conclusion of chapter 12. So looking at static equilibrium, um, static equilibrium itself is, uh, its functions is to sense the position of the head and help us to maintain posture while being motionless. So you're, you're not moving there. And then in dynamic equilibrium, dynamic equilibrium's functions to prevent the loss of balance during rapid head or body movement. So there's static and, and dynamic equilibrium. And we did do some of this in lab already when we did hearing and equilibrium. So static equilibrium, when you look, uh, you have the uh, vestibule of the inner ear contains the two membranous chambers that are responsible for static equilibrium. The utricle communicates with the semicircular canals and the uh, saccule communicates with the cochlear duct. So there you can see the saccule there. So each of these chambers contain the macula or uh, what we refer to as the organ of static equilibrium. So here you can see the maculae in green. The macula is composed of hair cells that are in contact with a jelly-like fluid containing calcium carbonate crystals. When the head is moved, the gelatin uh, sags due to gravity and the hair cells bend. This basically will then trigger a sensory impulse which travels on the vestibular branch of the VC nerve to the pons which directs the impulse to the uh, cerebellum for interpretation. So here you can see the, the macul macula, um, better structure there. Uh, gravity pulls on that gelatinous mass and pulls downward and therefore those hairs will be able to move. In dynamic equilibrium, remember its function is to prevent the loss of balance during rapid head or body movement. And dynamic equilibrium includes the three semicircular canals. And those are going to contain the organs that are responsible for dynamic equilibrium. So each semicircular canal ends in an enlargement called the ampulla. So here you can see the ampullae of the semicircular canals. There are three. And basically each ampulla houses a sensory organ for dynamic equilibrium called the crista ampul ampullaris. So you can see the crista ampullaris is going to contain a patch of hair cells in a mass of gelatin. So the crista ampullaris, uh, if, if you uh, see here, that's the sensory organ for dynamic equilibrium uh, located in the ampulla of each semicircular canal. And it consists of those hairs that extend upward into the dome-shaped uh, gelatinous mass. So rapid terms of the head or body are going to stimulate those hair cells, which is going to, to uh, create a nerve impulse. So what that nerve impulse Quickly going back, um, that nerve impulse, uh, when the head is moved, the gelatin stays put due to inertia, causing the hairs to bend, and that triggers a sensory impulse that's going to travel on the vestibular branch of the VC nerve to uh, the pons of the brain, which then directs the impulse to the cerebellum for interpretation. So there you can see the uh, vestibulocochlear nerve, the VC nerve, as it extends out there from the brain. 
here you can see a better picture of what the Christa ampullaris will look like. And here you can see uh, how they are, are um, the structure, the, the Christa ampullaris itself with the hairs, the hair cells, and supporting cells. And there would be that sensory or afferent nerve. All right, moving on with sight. The sense of sight is vision. Uh, the organ of vision is the retina of the eye. The sensory receptors are called photoreceptors. And when photoreceptors are stimulated to a threshold impulses, they travel within the optic nerve, which is cranial nerve two, to the visual occipital cortex for interpretation. So you can see the sense of sight. Uh, the retina is, of course, the organ of interest there in the eye. So here you can see the eye itself with the iris and the pupil. There's the bones that make up the uh, uh, orbital wall. So the ethmoid, lacrimal, and palatine bones, zygomatic, sphenoid, nasal, and frontal. Here are the muscles. So you have the inferior rectus muscle, the superior rectus, lateral, medial rectus, and the inferior and superior oblique. And then you can see the different parts of the eye. So the eyeball, the sclera, cornea, uh, lens, and then pupil. So looking at the uh, visual accessory organs, uh, there are, are a few. Um, the first being eyelids, and the eyelids are protective shields for the eyeball. Uh, they have the conjunctiva, and the conjunctiva is an inner lining of the eyelid, and it's the red portion around the eye. So uh, it's composed of four layers, the skin, the muscle, connective tissue, and the conjunctiva. And then you have the lacrimal apparatus. Well, quick, quickly going through. Um, so there's your eyelid. And then here you can see the, uh, some of the muscles, vision. The lacrimal apparatus, uh, that's the part that's going to do tear secretion and distribution. So you can see the network right here as far as its structure. In there you have the lacrimal gl gland, and the lacrimal gland is going to be responsible for tear secretion, and it's located on the upper lateral surface. Remember that tears contain an enzyme called lysozyme, and lysozyme um, is going to function as an antibacterial agent. In there, you also have the uh, lac uh, nasal lacrimal duct, and the nasal lacrimal duct is going to carry those tears into the nasal cavity for drainage. So you could see the lacrimal gland, the can uh, canaliculi, which is going to collect the tears, the lacrimal sac, collect from the canaliculi, and then you have the nasal lacrimal duct, um, which empties the tears in the uh, nasal cavity. So here's looking at the retina. Here are components of the eye. Again, a uh, different view, pupil, iris, cornea, ciliary body, uh, suspensory ligaments, and the lens. <clears throat> Extrinsic muscles of the eye. The extrinsic muscles of the eye are going to hold the eyeball in the orbital cavity and allow for the eye to move. Um, the name of the cranial nerves that innervate these muscles are, are, are basically associated with uh, their area. So you have the superior rectus muscle, inferior rectus muscle, the lateral rectus muscle, you have the medial rectus muscle, you have the inferior oblique, inferior oblique, and the superior oblique. So superior rectus rotates the eye up and medially. Inferior rectus rotates the eye down and medially. And the medial rectus rotates the eye medially. And then here you can see uh, the breakdown of those muscles on a, a diagram. So here is the superior rectus, lateral rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, superior oblique, and inferior oblique. You also have the lateral rectus, which is going to rotate the eye laterally. 
the superior oblique rotates the eye down and laterally, and inferior oblique rotates the eye up and laterally. The structure of the eye itself, looking at the eye, the eye is composed of three distinct layers or tunics. The outer tunic or fibrous is a protective layer, and that contains both the sclera and the cornea. So the, the three layers uh, are the, the outer fibrous tunic, the middle vascular tunic, and the inner nervous tunic. So the tunics of the eyebrow, you have the, the uh, outer tunic, which is the fibrous cornea and sclera. You have the middle tunic, which contains the vascular iris ciliary body and choroid coat. And then you have the uh, other area, which is the nervous and retina. So let's take a first look at the outer tunic. The outer tunic contains both the cornea and the sclera. The cornea is the transparent, transparent anterior portion of the eye. And what you have here, its functions is it's going to focus 75% of incoming light rays. The sclera is the white posterior portion, which is continuous with the eyeball, except where the optic nerve and the blood vessels are going to pierce through it in the back of the eye. It has two functions, protection and attachment for eye muscles. So there you can see the cornea and the sclera. In the middle tunic, this is the vascular level, so it's going to uh, provide nourishment and uh, a couple more things. You have the choroid coat, and that choroid coat is a membrane that's joined loosely to the sclera containing many blood vessels to nourish the tissues of the eyes. In the ciliary body, the ciliary body is an anterior extension from the choroid coat, which is composed of two parts. The first part would be the ciliary muscles, and the ciliary muscles are going to control the shape of the lens. So that is, it's going to help uh, for it to accommodate. And then you have the uh, ciliary processes, and these are going to be located on the periphery of the lens. And one of those would be the su uh, suspensory ligaments. So ciliary processes in the suspensory ligaments, they're going to extend from the ciliary process on the lens to the ciliary muscles. So that is, they're going to help connect above structures. And then their function is to hold the lens in place. So here you can see the ciliary body, and then you can see the uh, suspensory ligaments there to hold that lens in place. So accommodation. Um, I said the ciliary muscles are, are playing a role in accommodation. Accommodation is the process by which the lens is going to change a shape to focus on close objects. So the lens is responsible with uh, the cornea as well for focusing incoming light rays. And if the light rays are entering the eye from a distant object, then the lens is flat. And then when we focus on a close object, the ciliary muscles are going to contract and the relaxing, uh, causing a relaxation of the suspensory ligaments. And then accordingly, the lens will thicken and allow us to focus on the object. So here you can see the iris and ciliary body of the chor uh, choroid coat. The anterior portion of the eye, uh, that is filled with aqueous humor. The lens. Here you can see the lens here in a, in a better picture. Uh, 
There's the ciliary bodies, so that you can see the ciliary process and the ciliary muscles. And then here we have uh, accommodation. All right, so now we're going to look at the structure of the eye, and we're going to look at the middle tunic, or the vascular area. And there we have the iris, which is the colored ring around the pupil. It's a thin diaphragm muscle. It lies between the cornea and lens. The iris separates the anterior cavity and the anterior chamber uh, and the posterior chamber. Uh, the entire anterior cavity is filled with aqueous humor. And aqueous humor in itself is going to help nourish the anterior portions of the eye and helps the eye maintain shape uh, it helps maintain the shape of the anterior portion of the eye. So here you can see the, the aqueous chamber. The next part, the inner tunic, the nervous or sensory area, this would be the inner lining of the eyeball. This is the site where we have photoreceptors, uh, and that would be the retina. So the retina is the inner lining of the eyeball containing the photoreceptors. Um, a picture of the retina can be taken with a camera, which will be attached to an ophthalmoscope. And basically, if you look at the parts there, you can see the optic disc. The optic disc is the location on the retina where the nerve fibers are going to leave the eye and join with the optic nerve. And then you have the central artery and vein that is also going to pass through this disc. No photoreceptors are present in the area of the optic disc, so therefore you get a blind spot. Then you have the posterior cavity, and the posterior cavity of the eye is occupied by the lens, the ciliary body, and the retina. So there you can see the, the retina, there you can see the vitreous humor, the optic disc, there are the nerves, there's the neural component, there are some more optic nerves, and now we look at the posterior cavity. The posterior cavity of the eye is composed, uh, is not composed, the posterior cavity of the eye is better yet occupied by the lens and and here you have the ciliary body and the retina so the posterior cavity is filled with vitreous humor and vitreous humor is a jelly-like fluid uh, which contains the spherical shape of the eyeball and it literally keeps the retina intact so the vitreous humor um, holds the retina flat against the choroid coat and you can see that in the, in the diagram here on the slide. So there you have the anterior and posterior cavities. You have the major groups of retinal neurons. So you have the receptor cells, bipolar cells, and ganglion cells. And these are going to provide the pathway for impulses through um, uh, triggered, uh, provide the impulses triggered by photoreceptors and therefore they're going to react to that optic nerve. So a summary of the layers of the eye, you have the outer layer called the sclera, the middle layer called the chor choroid coat, and then the inner layer called the retina, and then you can see the functions are protection, and then secondly, the blood supply pigment prevents reflection, and then lastly, photoreception and impulse conduction. An anterior portion of the outer layer would be the cornea. The middle po uh, anterior portion of the middle layer would be the ciliary body and iris. And in the inner layer, there is no anterior portion. And then the function of the outer, outer layer is light transmission and refraction. And the middle layer would be accommodation, which controls light intention uh, and control of light intensity. So really quick with light refraction. Refraction is the bending of light. So incoming lights are refract, refracted or bent onto the retina due to the convex surface 
of both the cornea and the lens. So you have types of lenses. You could have those that are convex and those that are concave. Convex lenses cause light waves to converge. Concave lenses cause light waves to diverge. When focusing on the, the retina, um, the pathways are going to be, as the light enters, it is refracted by convex surface of the cornea and the convex surface of the lens. And therefore, the image on the retina is upside down and reversed from left to right. So the pathway through eye, as light travels, it's going to go the cornea, the aqueous humor, the lens, the vitreous humor, and the photoreceptors in the retina. And then once the rods and or cones are stimulated to threshold, a sensory impulse is then carried into the brain to produce an image. So the visual receptors, there are two types of visual receptors, or what we call photoreceptors, in the retina. You have rods, and rods are photoreceptors for night vision and produce silhouettes of the image. And then you have cones, which are photoreceptors for color vision and produce sharp Im images. Then you have the macula lutea. So you can see rods and cones. Some histology of the retina, sclera, choroid, and, and neural retina. Also in visual receptors, you have the macula lutea, and the macula lutea, spelled M-A-C-U-L-A-L-U-T-E-A, -A -E um, it's a yellow spot of mostly cones, and I think we could see that back here, hold on a minute. I guess not. So you have the macula lutea, which is the yellow spot of mostly cones, and the favia centralis, F-O-V-E-A, centralis, uh, it's depression of all cones that produces the sharpest vision there. So uh, you do have refraction disorders. You have con concave lens uh, correctness, that's nearsightedness, or convex lens corrects farsightedness. All right, visual pigments. Uh, these are found in membranous sacs in the rods and cones. They are sensitive to light energy. You have the rods, uh, uh, rhodopsin, and the rods contain rhodopsin, which is um, contains the protein opsin attached to the pigment or retinal, and light causes the retinal to change shape, releasing it from the opsin. And the chain reaction of events results in closing of sodium ion channels, and that ultimately results in the hyperpolarization, which slows the tonic firing of action potentials. So when you have it dark adapted, the dark adapts it, adapted all opsin and retinal uh, is together, and the rods are very sensitive, so the vision uh, is possible even in dark. You have light uh, adapt it, which most opsin and retinal decomposes, and this is when the cones would then take over, and you get sharp color vision resulting. So when you have the cones taking over for light adapt it, uh, these are iopsins, and uh, similar to rhodopsins, there are the three types of pigments, and those would include the erythrolab, uh, chloro, and cyano, and this would be basically the E-R-Y-T-H. Um, that prefix associates red. The chloro prefix C-H-L-O-R-O -O, refers to green. And then you have cyano, C-Y-A-N-O, uh, that refer to blue color. So the combination of stimulation would then of these pigments would result in different colors. So here you can see vision of cones, the cones versus the rods. Uh, stereoscopic vision. Uh, stereoscopic vision is produced because humans uh, produced because humans have binocular vision. 
So the eye produces a slightly different image for the brain to interpret it because of the, the visual cortex puts together that 3D image. So it provides perception of distance and depth. And that's going to result in the formation of two slightly different uh, retinal ang ang angles there. So looking at the visual nerve pathway, um, once the rods and or cones are stimulated, a sensory impulse is carried on the first, the optic nerve, which is cranial nerve two, and then it's going to cross at the optic chiasma, forming optic tracks that carry the impulse to the thalamus for direction to the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe for the brain to interpret the image. 12.5 lifespan changes, um, basically age-related hearing loss, age-related visual, and age-related taste and smell problems. So going over some lifespan changes, uh, diminished senses are often one of the first noticeable signs of aging. Um, by the 50s, smell and taste diminishes. Uh, um, Uh, basically, if you look, this is uh, due to a loss of those taste receptors. You also could have hearing loss. Um, that can be attributed to decades of cumulative damage to, one, the spiral organ. So we say by age 60, 25% of the population has hearing loss. Between ages 65 and 74, 33% have hearing loss. By age 85, 50% of the population has hearing loss. In addition to damaged spiral organ, hearing loss can be due to a degeneration of pathways to the brain. Um, for visual problems, you could have dry eyes, itching, burning, diminished vision. You could have floaters and light flashes, which is clumping of the vitreous humor and vitreous humor pulling away from the retina, respectively. Um, that would cause those floaters and, and light flashes. Um, you could also have the inability to read small print, uh, presbyopia, I think that is the correct pronunciation, uh, P-R-E-S-B-Y-O-P-I-A, so that's the inability to read small print, and that basically is due to the loss of elasticity of the lens because you have diminished accommodation there. Uh, glaucoma is a result of the aqueous humor formation exceeds the rate of removal causing increased pressure and then of course cataracts and cataracts are caused by an accumulation of the lens and then the lens becomes cloudy and opaque causing a yellow tint. You could also have retinal detachment and muscular degeneration. That's it for chapter 12.